Hello, I'm Alice Hutchinson, the owner of Bird's Books, an independent bookstore in Bethel, Connecticut, and I'm honored to be the host of Write America. The aim of this series is to help set the country back on a correct, productive course of freedom, justice, equality, and plain human kindness. Write America is a literary series created by author Roger Rosenblatt, featuring award-winning, nationally renowned authors and new and emerging writers in readings and conversations each week about how books and art might bridge the deep divisions in our nation. Write America celebrates the quiet power of art in our lives, the unifying power of the highest uses of language. In novels, stories, essays, and poems, we recognize one another as parts of the human family, one family. Roger has penned a letter to our Write, Write America community, and I share it here with you now. Dear friends, I'm thinking we might do something for the Ukrainian refugees, consonant with our interests and inclinations. That is books, specifically children's books. Right now, generous and heroic people in Poland and elsewhere are greeting the refugees with the essentials, food, clothing, and shelter. What if we contributed dollars that went toward buying children's books so that books too might greet kids when their bedraggled families arrive in safe places? Putting a coloring book, a picture book, or a fable or a story in the hands of an exhausted and bewildered child might help to lessen the sorrow and the terror children feel in these circumstances. Anyway, that's the idea. And we have found a way through the Polish Universal Reading Foundation. The Publishers Weekly article on their effort is in the link in the chat. Caldecott Metal Sophie Blackle brought the idea forward, and it seems the right fit for us. This is purely a suggestion to you as individuals. Donate to donate to help supply books to Ukrainian refugee children and funds to the Ukrainian publishers. Follow the link at the bottom of the Publishers Weekly article. That's what I put in the chat. Everyone feels helpless in this horror, but no one as much as those directly affected. Maybe we can do a little to reduce the burden and the fear and give kids the calm and private joy books can install. Love, Roger. So with that, I welcome you. And please join us every Monday evening at this time as many of the most beloved and distinguished authors in the country read from their works and talk to each other and with you in an effort to bring us together. If you missed last week's episode with Robert Reeves and Jill McCorkle and Magdalene Brandeis or any of the previous episodes of Write America, you can go to Bird's Books Crowdcast channel and watch the recordings at any time. Tonight's episode is also being recorded, so if you miss something, you can go back and rewatch. Tonight, Bird's Books hosts a reading by in conversation with Jamal May, Michelle Whitaker, and Lindsay Atkins. I will return at the end and after readings and discussions to bring your questions and comments to the authors. A few notes about Comcast. Feel free to comment in the chat to the right of your page throughout the evening. That's what it's there for. But if you have a question, please look to the bottom of your screen and you'll see Ask a Question. That's where I will go to look for your questions that you might have for these authors. The green link to this episode on Bird's Books website where you can purchase the author's book is also at the bottom of the page. You can go there, look around, maybe sign up for another episode, possibly buy a book. Now a little bit about our first speaker. Jamal May is a poet, editor, and filmmaker from Detroit, Michigan, where he taught poetry in public schools and worked as a freelance audio engineer and touring performer. His poetry won the 2013 Indiana Review Poetry Prize and appears in journals such as Poetry, Plowshares, The Believer, NER, and Kenyon Review. May has earned an MFA from Warren Wilson College, as well as fellowships from Cave Canem and the Stadler Center for Poetry at Bucknell University. He founded the Organic Weapons Arts Chapbook Press. Please welcome to the screen, Jamal May. Thank you, Jamal. Yeah. Hey, how's it going? <clears throat> um, peace, y'all. Um, real pleasant um, and just joyful to be here. And thank you all for your presence and attention. Uh, I think I got enough, just enough time for about um, four relatively short um, poems or mid range, a couple mid ranges. And um, just this this series in itself has me thinking about where the intrapersonal meets the interpersonal. Um, the thing about times like these is that it kind of always been times like this. I've been thinking a lot about this notion of us all being kind of born into a human versus human civil war. That's not our fault, but is our responsibility to end in our lifetimes. Um, so 
the work is going to be kind of that I'm sharing is um, it's all, I'm going to share all new work. So I'm kind of like scared of it, <laughs> like that good, fearful place where, um, where new things happen, where neurogenesis occurs. Um, so they're kind of thinking about fraternity. I'm thinking about connection, I'm thinking about neighborliness um, and where that meets a uh, kind of eternal journey, so to speak. So we'll see, we'll see what, uh, how much of that rings true as I read these. So thank y'all for y'all again, for y'all attention and y'all awareness. So this first one is called, there's awareness. And then there's awareness, but then there's awareness sudden and on you like a shadow. I wear mine like a cloak into the perturbation of peoples rippling up and down my neighborhood streets. In the first American city governed by Muslims, the dispensaries are still open and the dive bars are as bright as they are loud and kind. My neighbors are as quiet as they are holy and steady and I'm okay if they don't respond. When they do, I keep the heat of that voice close, greeting or blessing, and I whisper, atsego, back to it when I am alone. I am diligent at becoming the home I will invite them inside of, a day that may never come, but my, my, but my trajectory puts its lights in view of my path, which puts my view on the path in line with those lights of candles in the coming windows, the shimmer of ambient strings of bulbs being bent by the halos of the corners of my eyes. They smile like that when the traps unlock, when the mind unfurls and awareness arrives. All right, this is duck in heaven um, uh, or aronophobia uh, for this idea of um, everybody wants you in their their heaven, uh, to make their heaven more real by dragging you to there, um, if that makes sense. Um, so we'll see what happens with this. Duck in heaven, aronophobia. She tells me her idea of hell is being trapped in someone else's idea of heaven. And I figure nothing religious is ever going to get out of my head if I don't get the pliers to handle it myself. So it's back to the garage again, the dim lit alchemical bullshit, me crouching beneath the stairs, hoping the holy men that hunt me will get bored or at least irritated enough to keep their heavens off of me. I built mine out of the remnants of a hell some preacher doomed me to. This made holidays awkward. The brimstone alone was bad enough to make Nightcrawler blush. And if I could bamf the fuck up out of Yahweh's line of sight, I'd do it in a heartbreak. I mean, a dark beat. I mean, a beat break. I mean, a lot of the things I don't say. And just like that, the gurus are circling me again, all gleam and wonder, winking a supposedly shared wisdom that rings empty like a bell with no tongue. They wait for the secret handshake I was never taught. What wisdom did you just receive is how the incense seller starts a two hour conversation that proves I can respect the street sage, which is code for broke ass guru, which is code for authentic, which is code for don't kick the tires, don't check under the hoodie, don't ask why the divine can't figure out a balance sheet or learn a technique that is more useful to its neighbors than merely becoming local color, which is code for entertainment, which is considered disposable. When an imam on public access radio finishes his list of the hell about, I consider sharing my calling in to share my somewhat pearlier guest list, assuring him everybody's there or it ain't heaven, at least not yet. Death isn't the start or the end. It's an altar call for all of the unworshipped. It is a field of disconnected space, a gathering of broken antennae, because if you have a fan base or a friendship, you already know how hard it is to get a signal out without calling back a void. All right, a um, couple more, I think, the riff in a similar airspace. So this is good needs. Now I'm all about that semi-ascetic aesthetic. I want nothing, but I'll have some. I only take what I need. Sometimes I really, really need something nobody ever needs, except for me, gimme. I used to need a girlfriend until she ran out of need of me. Then I just needed a place for all the books she left behind. Before I left the university, they needed me to prove I was a good poet, not by writing good poems, 
by getting credit for poems. Mediocre or embarrassing, dangerous or irrelevant, didn't matter. Just anything a computer could track. Strangely enough, this did not lead me to need a job. Such a thing had outlived its usefulness the day it insisted it was more important than my humanity. The problem is mastery is not incentivized here. Here, one only needs to be skilled enough to make someone enough money to pay everyone enough to keep them from asking the wrong, right questions like, how exactly is this not a Ponzi scheme? Good enough to sell isn't very good at all in a country that buys garbage, to pass the time while it waits for the right sales to go buy trash. The trash is needed to pass the time. What if time has already passed? What if it passed so long ago? It is coming back around the track, huffing into the last stretch, cold on your heels, mechanical breath, fresh and necessary on the nape of your neck. <sighs> All right. Um, last poem here. Thank y'all again for listening. Much respect, um, um, love, and energy to all oppressed and damaged peoples around the world. Um, these different skirmishes. Um, you know, I could name all the places, but I think one of the issues is that we treat it like a seasonal thing. Like, like, like this season it's Ukraine, so Palestinians are. You know, that was last season, but um, I try to think of it as a more collective challenge to end this constant civil war between humans. Um, so the calling, it must have been a hell of a thing. That first time someone heard a voice booming inside their own fool skull and convinced a crowd of worshipers it was coming from out there. When asked for the first time if she hears voices, the girl is smart enough not to ask, don't you? Though she didn't know what else to call the, sing the hit single playing on loop in her head or the list of islands to escape to, she recited silently for years like a prayer. Either hospitals are filled with the pious or piety is filling those hospitals. Supposedly, you can't be skeptical and superstitious at the same time. So don't invite a priest to your seance if you're not going to let him bless the wine, burn sage and wave it in our faces. And if there's no room for sages and sage at your seance, don't bother inviting the witches. And if you could, if you are invoking the dead, calling on an old exhausted spirit with no witches around, we won't be at a seance. We will be in your apartment, burning candles in the wrong kind of incense. If the mystery forces guiding your cousin have no credibility to speak of and no intuitive pets are in attendance, shit, my lab coat might show from under my robes. A calculator may fall out of my pocket. If you have a problem with skeptics, take it up with the mini headed God I just invented or resurrected or killed in a fit of religious zeal. Help me hoist its body high enough to be lost in the trees. Then we can listen together for the forest of hushed voices. We used to hear them all the time. My people called them thoughts. We used to call this thinking. Thank God for listening, peace. Thank you so much, Jamal. Our second speaker is Michelle Whitaker. Michelle Whitaker is the author of Surge, Great Weather for Media, which was awarded a final medal for the 2018 Next Generation Indie Book Award. She has been published in the New York Times Magazine, New Yorker, Shenandoah, Upstreet, the Southampton Review, and other publications. She has received a Jody Donahue Poetry Prize, a Pushcart Special Mention, Cave Canem Fellowship for African American Poetry, and was a recipient of the 2017 New York Foundation of the Arts Fellowship in Poetry. Currently, she is a poetry editor for the Southampton Review. Please welcome to the screen, Michelle Whitaker. Let me find you, Michelle. There you go. Hi, everybody. You can hear me okay? <laughs> Hopefully. Um, thank you so much uh, to Roger, of course, um, just for having the allowing these conversations and. Um, I like to go back and sort of rewatch the other episodes again and again. I always find some new insights um, in, in the literature part and, and in the conversation part. Um, and thank you to Alice Bird's books and Jamal, that was beautiful. Um, you know, I'm a big fan of your books and your mind. Um, 
there was a line, um, the divine can't figure out a balance sheet. Well, yep, uh, love that. And it's so great to be able to hear Lindsay finally. I know she's always um, in our email boxes, um, you know, letting us know what Roger's uh, thinking about, but it's great to actually hear her work. Um, so I'm just gonna read three poems. Uh, and the first poem is called Freedom from Fear. And um, I had a slight, I had a little obsession with um, Shostakovich um, when I was a kid. Uh, I just fell in love with his music, particularly led me to um, thinking about and reading about uh, World War II um, composers and artists, um, some of whom decided to stay in, in their homelands during the war and some who left and some who died. And so um, I'll just read the poem. <laughs> um, Freedom from Fear. The ostinato movement of Shostakovich's piano trio works for staring at his picture taped above my headboard like an oasis of a father safely home every night. It's good for remembering your kin crawling in scores under floorboards, under ships wrecked and in and out of bureau drawers. This teaches me about bravery. This teaches me about the violence of haste. Is thou art baking a bull lies egotistical? I cannot barely write words efficiently above the ground with clean water and mechanical pens. And still this trio runs good for how we glower and worry about those fascists and Nazis. This trains me about my own homeland, this idol, this island's idleness as I watch out for boats breaching the shorelines. It reminds me of what's set to livid. It reminds me of what's trying to disown me from my brown heritage. I often ask myself for a truth about the eyes, how mine are actually not that different from yours. Have we adjusted the ownership of the word dark? This teaches me that dark isn't even a color or even human. It's good for the glorified bull face lie for a claw grip, but without hurry as it strokes the upper tips of our ears evermore ever slight or an ever stinging, as if you and I are animals in training, as if you and I are animals in separate cages. This is good for beyond those bedridden brambles. This teaches beyond me how the coffin relates to the night. Hmm. The next one is Me and Monster. Me and Monster's good morning mantra is what you see is what you get. Me and Monster like to scrutinize a scrutinizing God as a superlative act during meditation. Me and Monster sing about hair suicides in the shower. Ain't that a shame? God, stop her. Sink, stop her. Garbage, dispose of her. Me and Monster don't watch our stress labels or blood glucose levels. Me and Monster eat qu quackery and allergies. We down our daily wheat gluten, corn syrup, glyph this and that, BHT, yellow number five, six, seven, eight chemicals, to name a few in our rotten stew. Me and Monster tell bad jokes, but we don't know many good jokes. Maybe we don't like jokes. Me and Monster make a piecer, people pleasers, give away elder speak that smells like gold. We hunt for drama who blankly ignore history. We boo hiss against their capped teeth if we have to. But me and Monster also like to hide when we get suckered or be thrown back in the rodeo or when we work in with vices in woodshop class. If me and Monster got a dollar for every time been asked at a barbecue to spoon in bed in a bar and a video on the streets, on the beach, or with questions that subjugate hate, me and Monster could buy matching neck plates. Me and Monster 
We have kissed toads and rattlesnakes. We wear leather and serpent ferns and socks full of money to burn. Me and Monster make up words in our texturized frames, like autocorrect asterisks we like to share our bare breasts. But me and Monster hide misunderstandings in our corsets. Sometimes we'd rather wear our masks than open our oxygen. And me and Monster do not like to practice judgments. I mean, sometimes at night. We play games of windfall. We lick our ice, cu ice cream gavels. And before we sleep with our sweats, we yowl like the moon calves, then trap each other's prayers in our overgrown cares. And this last poem is called Bonefish. Bonefish. At my birthday dinner, I chose the wood stove salmon. Despite my ex love dictating from a parasitic medical book and his blood stained scrubs, the ways uncooked salt fish could ingest stomach lining with tapeworm. Even when I silenced myself, blinking wildly away our intestinal tubing, his Russian dialect continued whispering bright light through the back door of my black hair. This took me from the present. And I wanted to be present. I wanted to eat the wood stove salmon. I did not want to pretend this was not war. This was not murder, kicking through walls of generations of people heaped around a table as descriptors or dissenters as I looked down again at my very own plate of my girl grilled in her pink guts as if to say it's game over. Even when I could scale this into a slendro and instead say it's gamelan, honey. When will I understand about why gongs were going off in the indigenous islands? As I knew, I should have just gone to the card catalog and memorized more than the words Bonang and Woyang. But instead, I turned away. So when the waiter asked, ma'am, is everything OK? How's your salmon? I kept thinking how knowing better has me in a chokehold as if burying another's bones with my birthright. Instead, when the waiter asked, ma'am, how is everything? I stuck a fork in it and showed my teeth as nature has sometimes taught me to when holding a knife to its neck and saying it's fine, it's all fine. Thank you so much, everybody, for listening. Thank you, Michelle. Our third guest is Lindsay Atkins. Lindsay Atkins is a writer from Western Massachusetts whose work has appeared or is forthcoming in Electric Lit, in Electric Lit Narrative, Tinder, po Tinderbox Poetry Journal, and Great Weather for, me for Media. Excuse me, I'm going to start again. Lindsay is a form is a writer from Western Massachusetts whose work has appeared or is forthcoming in Electric Lit Narrative, Tinderbox Poetry Journal, Great Weather for Media. Frontier Poetry, Crab Fat Magazine, So to Speak Journal, and Sugar House Review, among others. She is a recipient of the Amy Award from Poets and Writers, the Phyllis B. Abrams Award in Poetry, and an Author Fellowship from Martha's Vineyard Institute of Creative Writing, and holds an MFA from Stony Brook, Southampton. Please welcome to the screen, Lindsay Adkins. Let me find you here, Lindsay. There you are. Hello. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. And thank you to Alice for the wonderful introduction. Um, thank you to Roger for organizing this um, wonderful group and event. And um, thank you to Jamal and Michelle, whose work I adore and admire. And I am so honored to um, read alongside the both of you. Um, what a joy this is. Um, so I'm going to read a few poems. Um, these are all very new, uh, very fresh. Um, they, uh, I, um, I'll preface this with the fact that I, I have an 18 month old daughter. And so a lot of my poetry recently has dealt with um, motherhood and the ups and downs with that. Um, and also a lot of it has dealt with um, 
the particularly difficult postpartum period that I had. Um, I've really kind of used my writing to try to um, delve into that and analyze that. So um, without further ado, um, I'll just jump right in. Um, so this first poem um, is called Pumping in the Psych Unit. <clears throat> Intake nurse, what brings you here? How to tell him each minute has become elegy for the last. I nursed my daughter yesterday, watched my leg untangle for a moth's trail, resolve into a distance between two points, watched my nipple seep into the cracks of sustenance. The baby, I swear, could pull milk from my knuckle. I am good for looking out windows, following telephone wires to horizon, and in this stanza turning that dip there into her collarbone. By this stanza, it is again just a wire. I am sad, I tell the nurse, on a scale of one to 10, 10. My breasts have hardened, leaked through my gown. I unsnap it like it's her onesie, every movement measured now against my care for her. The nurse hands me my manual pump and turns away. He talks of new pills, hormone imbalances, no more breastfeeding. I must wean myself while I extract the milk. I wonder the whole time if recovery is possible when I don't know how to have a body, just how to make one. Somewhere, my daughter is waking in her crib, lips puckered, ready for what I can't give her. Somewhere, she is hungry. Um, and this next poem um, is called The Nurse Examines My Body. The nurse examines my body for marks, cuts, tracks, drags her fingers over my skin like it's glass and she might find dust. She laughs and says, I don't look like I just had a baby. One time in high school, I sat down in the calf and the girls all shrieked through tuna salad and clapped before I could even tell them I'd done it over the weekend under a ratty blanket in my boyfriend's parents' basement. Once my mom picked me up from a sleepover, looked at me in the rear view and said, someone kissed you. Another time I called an ex crying, babbling mismatched consonants and vowels, but he knew I'd sweated against another body a predictable plot point in the unseen arc of my voice, or it's just easy, like peeling back thin, thin bark on a twig, looking for green to see if the tree is alive, like putting an egg in cold water to see if it floats or sinks. The nurse finishes, scratches her notes. I wrap the hospital gown around my too skinny frame. But I did, I say, I did. Um, and this next poem is called My Coworker is Having a Baby um, and sort of, I don't know, kind of tries to um, talk about, I, I don't know, sometimes the mixed, the mixed feelings that that can bring up, um, being really happy for someone and um, also trying to, you know, wanting to um, be there for them and support them and, and kind of let them know, you know, that there could be some, some rough waters ahead. And um, yeah, so anyway, um, my coworker is having a baby and I don't want to scare her. I don't want to tell her legs and arms feel rain, same as a roof can. Stomachs heave and fall louder than any furnace. A brain plays tricks on itself. Thoughts scrambling in and out of the cracks in the wall like shiny cockroaches before you have a chance to catch them if you even want to. My therapist told me that hormonal changes can increase obsessive thoughts. Hysterectomy and hysteria share one too many letters for it to be a coincidence, and I really don't care. I'm just pissed no one wants to do anything about it. Plato said the uterus is a living shadow that wanders around a woman's body, darkening every room. In the sunlit hall, my coworker smiles. It's starting to feel real, she says. She cannot hear the living shadow wandering around my body, knocking on every bone, looking under each blood vessel, searching for any fragmented shard of memory from those first three months after my daughter was born that is bright and warm, and we are both untouched by the rain. 
Um, and this last poem that I'll read is called um, Third Anniversary or First Anniversary After the Birth of Our Daughter. Um, apparently the gift you're supposed to give on the third anniversary is leather. Um, if, I don't know if anyone follows those things, but I, I thought that was um, interesting and obviously, um, you know, there's there's the animal cruelty aspect to it as well, you know, I, which it's a little bit um, sickening. But um, uh, so this poem is just kind of a, a, a little bit of a meditation on that. Um, third anniversary or first anniversary after the birth of our daughter. Into that skin, a lone bull curls its throat back to neck, arc of horn, empty gray fields, pink eyelid of morning. In high school, they rumored tipping, sparse fences, missing posts, gaps wide enough for past curfew bodies. I imagined the feeling of toppled animal, immobility, a spine in the dirt, the quiet sting of mosquitoes. Before fear, before boot, thunder, and the impossible shotgun, there are true stars and fragments of knowing no living thing moves on its own. My mother's love was not a man-made material. She bought me leather shoes to walk in. Your feet need to breathe, she'd say, the tiny lungs in my heels huffing while she pressed her thumb on my toe to measure room for growth. Thrilling to be found, to feel where my body stopped and started. Many times I'd watched her or my father sift through bins of frozen supermarket meat, looking at cuts, dates, fat. There was always a right choice. We can choose rawness then. We can choose to have a choice. Last year, cotton, next year, fruit and flowers, leather between, but we've already seen my body give and stretch, breathe to cocoon another, no exchange of coin. How am I both animal and its empty dried out skin, both what I was and what I will be? Our daughter lies here, rubbing her back into the carpet, unable yet to roll. We can show her how to move, how to reach forward, pull back without coming apart. Thank you. Wow. I find it so hard to talk about the body sometimes. <laughs> Those are really beautiful and um, uh, some of the poems seem to sort of examine the like like the outside observer, which I really loved, like what you observe outside and sort of the the postpartum that you're talking. And then the like last poem seemed to like really sort of investigate the in internal world. Um, and uh, so I was thinking about like you both decided to read newer work. Um, I typically do, but I, I didn't. Um, so I'm just curious, like, like what your process is that feeling, you know, like working out really like personal and sort of sensitive topics out in the public. Um, is that just like part of your process or you just really felt like this was the time to, you know, air them, air them out? Well, <clears throat> I'll say that um, there was a few re things that went to it. I had my I had my books here and was ready to read. Um, I was going to maybe do a mix, um, but uh, for one, there's an ex um, kind of excitement about and like in that like risk of like, well, I don't know how these sound yet. And then also, there's part my part of my editing process is presenting work, and um, with the you know pandemic, it's been, has been in as many opportunities. Um, but I just got back from um, Mizzou and. Um, and I read some new work there, and I read something for some Chicago folks on uh, Zoom kind of thing. And it's just something about, that's very present about um, the new work that feels just kind of where I'm at in my life in general, like uh, the idea of being present, using the past to contextualize the present, and thinking of the future less as a thing we're going towards and more of uh, something that has actionable steps in the present. And so, the, so being inside of the new work is just part of just staying inside of where I want to be as a person in general. 
Yeah, I'd say um, I, I try to make um, reading work or presenting work a part of my process as well. It has been a little bit more challenging the past couple of years. Um, and, you know, whether it's a reading or a workshop or even just, you know, kind of, you know, sharing with, with friends, you know, or, or other writers, um, which, you know, is, is a different thing. This is, this is a particular um, setting, obviously, but I, I do think it's, um, it is exciting and, and interesting to kind of see people's gut reactions. And obviously in this, in this particular um, platform, we don't get to see, you know, the audience, right? Um, so, so, you know, but we can still, you know, kind of, I don't know, see the comments and we can kind of, you know, yeah, I don't, it's, it, it, it's helpful, I, I think, I find it. Yeah, I was just, I was, um, I just like wrote a note here, Lindsay, with yours. I, I was just curious how you got into some of those poems. Like I heard the word um, meditation. A little bit is like Jamal's, like with the awareness or like trying to define that or like extract that out. Um, like say versus like, I was gonna say spectacle, but just to stick with the, the, the sort of the, investigating like like I guess what you were going through emotionally I was just curious about that process because I heard like research in it but then you know then it sounded like letters then it sounded like notes but I but it sounds like a poem but I was just curious about like how you got into that yeah yeah so I I um I definitely you know was going through some stuff emotionally I think it actually really kind of helped me to think about it from a more like um uh, i don't want to say scientific but from but like from the body you know what i mean because it was so emotional and so i think it was helpful for me to try and like ground it in the body and what was actually happening in my body and in my brain and um there there was some some research involved and and it's been a very interesting um experience and uh, interesting um stuff to learn about just you know and you know i think some of it we know and we talk about but i think a lot of it and look there's so much it's you know i'm not necessarily like i don't know <clears throat> blaming anyone but but there's there's like a lot that goes on that we we just don't talk about there's actually a whole term for it called matrescence which it, it like it borrows, um, I mean, it doesn't borrow, but it's like, it's like kind of like um, adolescence. It's like, it's like a specific period of time for a, a mother or, or a person who has had a child. And it's like, there really are like chemical and physical like changes that go on in the body. And um, it's, it's just it's it's very interesting <laughs> um and i i think for me just being like in the throes of it emotionally like it was just like i said it was helpful to try and 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 bring it back like to to the body and and ground it in that way mm -hmm. i had a um, question uh, for michelle um First of all, thank you, thank you both for the those readings. That was like re really powerful stuff. And uh, in both of, both of your work, um, Lindsay and Michelle, I, um, I noticed. I, um, I think I like the, the idea of the lens. There's a camera that kind of moves. Mm. Whereas um, with Lindsay's work, that's kind of inside-out camera where you get the interior and then the external landscape. I, I like the way that played um, inside of the poems, then across the poems. Like Michelle pointed out, how the last poem went to it's like a slightly different physical space. Um, and so thinking of that and Michelle and um you be um you're a multifaceted artist. Uh and so um I know you're a really strong photographer. Um we've seen seen lots of good good work there. Um so I'm i I'm wondering about is there a conscious relationship between like maybe what you do with audio recording, um, with the textual writing and then the the visual, um having those different strengths. I'm wondering um how they uh is it like a thing that's kind of working in the background when you're writing poems? Or do you have a more conscious interaction happening? Uh, well, thank you for that poem. I mean, poem. Uh, question. Uh, Questions like, are poems. Questions <laughs> poems. Um, 
I liked um I like walking in the um well I'll say it like how do I say this? So I was a pianist for a long time and I played scales for a long time, like 30 years. I never get tired of hearing scales or playing scales, but they always sound a little different to me. So that's kind of how I approach just walking, like in a park. It's like I take the same routes, but there's always something a little bit new to see. So that's the only reason why I take the pictures. So I'm not, I don't really have a goal in mind other than that's interesting way to, that's interesting to look at. And then I like to take it home and look at it again. Um, sometimes I like to flip it around and, and see. So I guess it's similar, like, you know, cause I know you're into music too, right? You're a sound engineer and it's like, sometimes I like to do that, I guess. I never know where the poem is going to take me a lot of the times, but sometimes what seems like the catalyst to the beginning might be really be the end of the poem. And I like, pl I like playing with that uh, process, but I mean, some of it's semi-conscious and just some of it is just developed into um, like what you both, you know, read like new poems. And I typically do for, I think, similar reasons why you do but I like to like read into a recorder and and then just hear it back as if that's not me who's reading and see if there are other, other opportunities that I'm not see seeing. So it, it's like, I'm less product oriented in a way and more just process oriented. But how about, how about the two of you? Or we could start with you because you're also multifaceted, I mean, um, that's the thing about the voice recorder, that's like, that's like my, that's my wheelhouse right now. <laughs> I have thousands of voice memos. <laughs> it's become a main part of my process, uh, especially since I've been doing more with improvisation. Uh, thinking about the, I think it was Thelonious Monk quotes that, um, comp, uh, improvisation is just composition sped up yep. and composition is just improvisation slowed down with an mm -hmm. eraser. And, uh, and that, that concept has been really true for me for, in the creative process. Um, like I had a, the one I read, Awareness, I was trying to figure out today if you even had that written down anywhere or if it was just like, because I know I heard a recording of it. I was like, wait, I got another poem. And then I was trying to find it on my computer. I was like, did I type this? Or did I just re handwrite it on the napkin or something and recite it? I couldn't. And um, so it, it very much has been using my all these different tools and like abilities that I have as, and like kind of funnel each one into each, like using what I learned from poetry inside of songwriting, using what I've learned for composition inside of um, the, the generative process and the revision process. Um, so yeah, very much a mid blend of things happening over here. Yeah, totally relate to everything you're saying. Lindsay. Here's what I'm with you, Lindsay, too, because like with the research aspect of it too, there's like different types of material being brought into the mix. So curious about that process for you as well. Yeah, um, I, it's, I, it, it can be kind of like, I don't know, I kind of do it in ebbs and flows, like, uh, like, I'll write, and then I'll research, I'll write, and then I'll research, and, like, I don't know, oftentimes the research kind of prompts, prompts the poem for me, at least in, in a lot of these instances, like, you know, it is something that I'm interested in. And so I'll just kind of like, read about it, do some reach some research, and then something, something will stick out to me as being like, whoa, like what Plato said about the yeah. uterus being, I was like, whoa, okay, you know, um, something will kind of like jump out that I can either like relate to or that just like really strikes a chord um, for me. Um, I'm kind of curious, like for the both of you, um, Michelle, you mentioned that that for you sometimes it's seeing seeing where the poem takes you, which I love that that you know there's kind of that sense of of being willing and and um, you know like kind of a gameness to to play almost. And Jamal, your your work is is you know the way that you play with language is just you know so so amazing. I'm I'm wondering kind of about what what that looks like in terms of process. Like, do you kind of just 
you kind of just like let it go and like see what happens and then you you kind of go back and or and like how do you know i guess how much to tweak it and how much to kind of like let it be you know what what it is and what it wants to be um if that if that makes any if that makes any sense yeah i think i get the question well well here um so for me it's the the um, my process changes as i develop as a person you know and so um more more recently the way I play with language is because of kind of a lofty idea of truth in a way of thinking of this like truth as this thing that moves um, because nothing is stable in just like the cosmology of the universe. It's all shaking and moving around. Um, and so my um, process has been to like, so what I was saying about the improvisation thing, like what getting recordings of me is I'm finding what fits inside of my body as, as true from a, even a sonic way. And um, so words uh, tend to, and this, and I know this is actually kind of a thing about just how minds work around people that I grew up with and hang with. Um, we words kind of tend to go back and forth. I think it's part of um, our relationship to hip hop music, um, where you're expecting a lot of double entendres. You're expecting a, if I say a word, if we take it two or three different ways, you, you kind of almost expect it to be. And so that gets played up um, inside inside of my work um, from both an organic standpoint and a revision standpoint. And with revision, I think of that as part of the creative process. Like um, writing is um, drafting is just one part of writing, and so writing is also you know staring out a window at some birds, you know, for 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 forty five minutes. Um, it's just, it's the collection of all these little pieces. Then drafting is where I get all my pieces on the table. You know, I just dump out all my marbles and shells and sea stones or whatever. And then um, revision is where I'm kind of looking at what I've shaped, what's collected, and I do from that point what you said about you know kind of let like let like it's mentioned by both of you i think like letting the poem guy from there um i think the we're pulling stuff out of the subconscious and my, my relationship to language is less about like kind of a you know a idealized love of language and more of a suspicion of language and um i like this idea that i heard from steven i think he was calling someone else but he was talking about poetry giving words back their dignity like how um a word is this double-edged thing where you say river and you feel like you're encompassing the river, but you know, it's a shortcut and you're leaving out, you know, like the stones in there, the fish, you know, how long it took to carve that path through the, through the landscape. So we can share ideas with words, but they also can be like deceptive in what they carry. And so with playing with words, I feel like I'm reminding myself, if not other people, and, and you know, all my poems are just bad signals. Let's put them up and I find my tribe by like who vibes with the poems. But like for myself, finding this way to keep the language, um, like mine, but still connected to something beyond language. And so I'm trying to use the words in a way to say, like, look at the space between the words. Yeah. yeah. I love that. The uh, first time I heard Jamal's uh, word, I uh, heard Jamal read was that uh, in AWP, oh, yeah. reading with Thomas Lux. I and, was reading. Yeah, and you, you read and I was like, I recognize, I recognize the sounds. Like, I feel like I was trying to, I was trying to do similar things in my work when I like recognize, I felt like what this Pope was doing, which was a little different than, you know, what I was hearing in some other readings, we'll just say that. Um, so yeah. I, I felt an affinity when I first read your work. I was like, okay, there's like, it's just hard to explain. Cause it's not like, like using the music metaphor, it's more of a harmony than like an octave, you know? It was like, there, there was something different, but harmonious there. Yeah, I mean, um, like the Shostakovich poem was really written to the sec that movement, that ostinato. So it's really meant to go over that particular piece. Um, and I always hear them together, even though I'm reading to an audience that can't can't hear it. But um, and then like Mia Master is really like uh, Thelius Moss, um, an old poem. I think it's called Mia Molly. No, it's actually called An Anointing, I think. Um, but I love that poem uh, because it was so. I mean, I was a teenager, and it was there was something so provocative about it, and so raw. And I don't think mine even does any justice, but it, it's just in dialogue with it. So I'm, you know, I I feel like I've seen you write about um, Jamal, like the after poem, like when you're doing, you know, when you're sort of in yeah. conversation. Um, and it's sometimes it's hard to get away from that, but every so often, you know, there's a poem that hits you and, and you just want to be 
in conversation, in dialogue with a particular poem, you know, or have a response. It's like it's like a call, <laughs> and here's my response, you know, kind of thing. But yeah. I came back because there's a few questions down here that, that uh, our guests have asked um, and nicely, nicely pulled together because there's one for each of you. Uh, Michelle, your first poem is perfect for this moment. When did you write it? Oh, um, I wrote it a few years ago. Maybe, I'm going to say, I've been working on it from for many years, let's just say that. Um, I just always wanted to set text um, or set text to music. So I guess it's kind of a frastic in that way or, um, but um, my goal is, my goal eventually is to hopefully perform this, <laughs> but I'm not really good with technology or how to set that up. I really need to find, somebody like a sound engineer or somebody to figure out like how how do I do this in a public forum but I, I you know I, I appreciate it and I was yeah I grew up on Long Island and you know Long Island has a checkered past um with World War II too um but you know it's just you never know when your 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 city or your community or your island will be breached right um, as we're seeing now, or we see over and over and over and over again. So it's not like, it wasn't like a fake concern. It was like a real concern. Um, so I guess I'm just always working on it because the problem is always there, unfortunately. Thank you. This question's for Lindsay. The poem about postpartum depression is so powerful and real and honest. How did you know when to write the poem? How much distance from the experience did you want to have before you felt ready to tackle the experience in the poem? Um, so I'm guessing this is about the, the first one. Um, I didn't, I didn't really think about it um, in terms of like uh, timing or when should I write it? Should I not? Um, it, I, it was more just like I felt like I had to almost in a way. Um, so um, I will say that, you know, I, 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 um, I continued to, to edit it, you know, um, after the fact, which um, I think was helpful kind of having that distance, especially for the editing process. Um, but when I wrote it, I, I was, I was very, very close to, um, the experience, you know, I, I was living it. Um, and then, you know, for, for revising, I think it was, it was good, you know, maybe having some of that distance where I could really go back and, and, you know, look at it through more of a, a craft lens as opposed to, you know, just really, um, getting it all out on the page. Thank you. Jamal, the question that I have for you, when you first started speaking, you talked about, uh, well, you basically reminded us that although this, this war in Ukraine is horrible and very much in the forefront, that there are other wars and conflicts still going on throughout the world. And your sense of community about how to kind of bridge our way out of that thinking. How long have you had this worldview and how did it come about? <clears throat> um, weirdly, I, it's it was a thing that I thought of really young <laughs> and then I was kind of a weird kid. So I was like maybe seven and I would have these ideas and I would be like, ah, but you're seven, so whatever, <laughs> you know? And, it, and there were some things that I kind of thought humanity would have figured out by the time I was the age I am now. And, and so some of these things kind of come in waves, you know, and it comes back to you with a different, when you're at a different state of being, different, um, like places, like just in your general con consciousness, right? Just your awareness of, of the world. And, um, and so when it came back, when like reading these different thinkers on, uh, on peace, you know, it always comes back to this idea of um, the, the global community you see this from a lot of global um globally minded artists particularly this idea of drawing people together and just if you think of like a perspective shift 
there's a different way to end a civil war than there is to end a war against another. Um, you end the war against another by defeating them, by crushing them, by taking them over. You end a civil war by finding common ground and remembering that you're the same peoples. And so, um, so the language around it is relatively new, just like in the way I think of the, just like in conversation with myself and other people and other active, like a local activist, um, because there is a school of thought where, where rather than trying to topple the machine, you understand the machine will topple itself and you take care of what's underneath. And um, that's what you see with a lot more of community building, but there's a way you work locally while thinking as a globally minded uh, person. So it's something I thought of when I was like seven, but the development of it as a way of speaking with people and a way of making art is um, in the last like year, a couple of last years, a couple of years of work. We need a poet on these national think tanks. Sure. You know, we need to find, we need to find some common ground with poetry too. So this really has, to me, this discussion has really addressed what the, goal of right America is. So I really, um, I have two more quick questions for you because I am a bookstore. It's going to be about books and it will wrap up the evening. So I want to be sure that I say thank you to each of you, but I have two questions. And one of them is what emerging author that you might know about, do you think we all should know about? Go. It's not homework. You can just come up with anybody, anybody, you know, Um, Go ahead, Michelle. So um, I would say uh, um, Casey Judds, that's J-U-E-D-S. Um, her book is, that I discovered is Keeper. It has a little bird on it. Um, and it's just a beautiful, lyrical uh, piece of work that I just read over and over and I'm still reading through it. Thank you. Yeah. Lindsay? Um, I'm going to say Claudia Acevedo Quinones, who's oh, actually yeah. um, a member of, of, of Right America. Um, she just had a chat book out called Bedroom Pop, and she has a, um, a book coming out later this year, I believe. Um, she's, she's wonderful. Thank you. Jamal. Okay, so um, when I think emerging, that's kind of the first book. Is that's like the range. Um, so I want everybody to check out Tommy Blount. He's a Detroit poet. His um, first book is Fantasia for the Man in Blue, and I'm um, just a fantastic writer. I tend to read. I don't really read books cover to cover. I tend to read a poem at a time, and I feel like that's a book you could just jump in anywhere, grab any poem, mm -hmm. and carry that with you for the day. So check out Tommy Blount, Fantasia for the Man in Blue. B l o u n t. B L O U N T. Yep. Got it. I'm taking notes, guys. Um, okay, what are y'all reading? Who's got what on the shelf? Well, I can go, well, I wanna... I'm going to start making recommendations if you don't tell me what I'm you're still, reading. <laughs> so I'm actually going to recommend um, a graphic series. I'm rereading a series um, called Saga. And, oh yeah. Um, and I, I highly recommend everybody to check it out. I got my twin reading it. She's like, she's hooked. She went get the books back. Um, so, um, so, Fiona, so um, Brian K. Vaughn and Fiona Staples, uh, fantastic team. Um, Fiona's artwork is phenomenal. And um, Brian K. Vaughn is a unique storyteller. So let's check that out. All right. Will do. Thanks. We got it. Um, I, I'm i still reading. Um, I don't know if I said this last time I was on Right America, but I'm still reading uh, Catherine May's uh, Wintering. And um, because... Uh, why mm. do I have to say why? I don't guess I don't have to say why. No, you don't have to say why, but it is a spectacular book. <laughs> me going both, are, both of you are, are picking things that I love. Go ahead. All and, right, the, and, and and I just oh, want to sorry. say in this one, I just have on my desk how to fly. Yep. Uh, I was really surprised by it. I thought it was really just just wonderful how-to poems. So Barbara. Uh, I don't know how to say her last name. King's King Solver. King Solver. Okay. Mm -hmm. Lindsay, what are you reading now? Um, I'm currently reading Now We're Getting Somewhere by Kim Adonizio. And bravo for reading with a with a toddler. <laughs> <laughs> it's way to go. Well, you know, I, I but poetry I think is 
particularly itself particularly well to that because you can read a poem or two and then, you know yeah just like jamal down. just said Come exactly yeah <laughs> well ladies and gentlemen i really want to thank you for this evening and as much as i hate to say goodbye i'm going to say goodbye and minimize you away and i'm so sorry to have this evening end but i do want to thank jamal Michelle and Lindsay for participating in Write America this evening and to everyone who tuned in tonight. And thank you to Roger Rosenblatt for creating this original and important series to look forward to each and every Monday evening. Tonight's episode was the perfect example of the purpose and mission of Write America, as I've already said. We hope to see you next Monday at 7 as we welcome Ken Oletta, George Howe Colt, and Susan Isaacs. Please remember to check out the Birds Books Write America page where you can sign up for upcoming episodes and maybe purchase a book or two. I have placed, again, the link to the charity in the chat. But good night and thank you again for coming.